Hi, I'm Alex and this is Tank Tested. Today I'll be setting up a carnivorous plant bog in this glass bowl. Now, a glass bowl isn't a great option for a setup like this, but I have some supplies with me that should help mitigate the risk and make this a suitable home for these plants for the medium term. So let's talk about these plants since they will be the centerpiece of this setup. First, I have a pitcher plant. Uh, and then I also have two small pots of Venus flytraps. Both of these are carnivorous plants from North America. And what a carnivorous plant is, is kind of exactly what it sounds like. These are plants that eat insects. Uh, they eat animals. They trap animals in two separate ways, and I'll get into exactly how they do that later on in this video. But the natural history behind these plants is super fascinating and will inform how I've set up this small bowl. So with that intro out of the way, let's go through what I have on this table. All of these materials are necessary for setting up a bowl like this, and uh, each one serves an important function for the support of these plants. So first I have peat moss. This peat moss will act as the soil in my bowl. And the reason why I've selected peat moss is because it's very, very good at holding water and has a very, very poor nutrient load. That's important because these plants are used to both being saturated with water and also having very, very low nutrients. That's actually why they evolved the ability to catch insects. They needed another option for how to collect nutrients from their environment. The soil just doesn't have enough nutrients for these plants to grow naturally. So instead they rely on the nutrients in flies and other insects to feed them. If you use a substrate other than peat moss, something with a higher nutrient load, you'll end up creating uh, burns on the roots of the plants and the plants will die. So this is a critical, critical step in this process. Now, I could fill this entire bowl with peat moss. And if I were to use a bowl with a drainage hole, the bottom, that might be a suitable option. But because I'm using a glass bowl, which is a dubious choice, frankly, uh, I need to find another solution because if I don't uh, allow water to drain, the water, the peat moss will get uh, super saturated and again, the roots may rot. Uh, so you don't want to do that. You don't want to drown your plants. So instead I'm creating an artificial aquifer with this. So this is lava rock. It's very porous and has a lot of area between each individual stone. That means that even though this looks like a dense pile of rock, there's actually a lot of area for water to fill in all those crevices. That means I'm basically gonna be creating an artificial aquifer or storage capacity within this bowl. The bottom inch to an inch and a half of this bowl will be lava rock, which means that all the water will drain from the peat moss and stop these plants from drowning. That's the aspiration at least. Obviously an easier solution would would be to use a bowl with a drainage port, but I don't have one on hand, so this is my solution. To create an artificial division between my lava rock and my peat moss, I'll be using these two pieces of gutter screen. I'll overlap them and create a nice barrier, semi-permeable barrier, so that the peat moss doesn't fill in all the holes that I want uh, to be available for water. Now, if I had my druthers, I would use a thinner or a, a narrower hold screen so that less of the peat moss falls through. But I don't have that on hand, and this bowl is only a temporary housing solution for these plants. Realistically, I can probably hold them for about a year in this bowl, um, and by that time, enough of the peat moss will have clogged up my aquifer that I'll need to transition them into another pot anyway. So I'm not too worried about this particular choice I'm making. Finally, I've got moss that I collected from my backyard. This is terrestrial moss. And then I've also got some rocks and some sticks. These will just allow me to scape my bowl once I've planted my plants and create a more aesthetically pleasing setup. Because after all, this is going to go in my home. I want it to look beautiful. The last ingredient I have on this table is water. Now, this isn't just normal tap water. This is distilled water. You can also use rainwater to water your carnivorous plants. Uh, and the reason why you don't want to use tap water is because tap water has a high uh, dissolved mineral count. And that will actually burn the roots of these plants. That's a common theme of these plants. They're used to having almost no nutrients coming through their root systems. So if you add nutrients, 
you will kill these plants. That's the balancing act that we have to make when we create a carnivorous bog setup. All right, so let's get started. I've actually pretty much measured out this lava rock, so I'm just gonna pour it straight into my bowl. I'll level it out and then lay over my two pieces of screen. This is basically creating an aquifer, as I said. This is a critical step uh, and hopefully it's relatively visually appealing. Now I am using exposed transparent glass so you will be able to see what's going on within the bowl. So I'm a little bit concerned that this transition layer will look a bit ugly, but it is what it is. Now I need to figure out what I'm going to do with my plants. For each of these plants, they're already in a peat moss uh, pot. So I'll be taking them out of the peat moss or out of a pot, but I won't be removing the uh, soil from around their roots. They're relatively established. They seem quite happy and healthy in their own soil. So I'll just be infilling around their soil with my peat moss. Before I do that, let's talk a little bit about the natural history of these plants. So we'll start with the Venus flytrap. The Venus flytrap is native to North and South Carolina, and maybe a little bit of Virginia, all on the East Coast of the United States. They are a threatened species in the wild, and it's illegal to collect them from the wild. So let's talk about how the Venus flytrap actually works. So each of these traps is actually an augmented leaf. Uh, it's one single leaf folded down its central vein. Now, uh, it actually has two stable states, one open and one closed. The plant doesn't have to exert any energy to either be open or closed, but it does have to exert energy to transition between those two. So inside of each leaf, they have a set of trigger hairs. And if more than one of those trigger hairs are triggered within a short period of time, the plant will snap shut. And it does so by uh, expanding and contracting cells along its hinge. Uh, it will actually, through osmosis, expand and contract a few cells which cause uh, one stable state of the leaf, the open stable state, to transition to the closed stable state. Once the leaf is closed and an insect is inside, it will start digesting that insect and actually transitioning that insect into the nutrients it needs uh, to continue growing more leaves. Now, each of these leaves does have a limited number of open enclosures that it can perform before it becomes exhausted. So if you keep Venus flytraps, it's important to not give in to the temptation of constantly poking their leaves and watching what happens. Uh, eventually they will stay closed and they won't be able to get any more food. Now, these plants are pretty good at capturing insects on their own. Uh, but if you need to feed them yourself, you want to feed one to two adult uh, flies per week or so to an adult plant. Uh, that's about all they need. If you overfeed them, uh, they will try to process all that nutrients and they'll actually end up dying. So you don't want to just jam them filled with insects. They don't need nearly as many as you might think. Uh, one to two a week is totally fine. The pitcher plant has a different approach to capturing insects. So this is again one leaf that's folded in around itself to create a tubed chamber. At the top of the tube you have this little uh, hood. That both blocks rainwater from filling the tube but also acts as a guide guiding insects into this tube. At the opening of the tube uh, the plant produces nectar. Um, or an, uh, you know, an intriguing substance for insects, a food source. Uh, this is not a flower, this is actually a leaf. Um, there's, there's no sex organs within this. But the, the insects will fly in, they'll land here, and then there is a very smooth surface at the opening of the plant. The uh, insects will stumble essentially and fall deeper into the tube. In the center of the tube, there are a bunch of tiny hairs that are all pointed downward. So as the insect falls down, it becomes trapped because all those little hairs stop it from going back up the tube. It can only go deeper. Once it's in this deep section of the tube, 
uh, the plant will then begin to emit enzymes to start digesting it. But there's actually an insect in this one right here. I can see it through the light, um, but there's a, a dark section here. Um, and that's how they capture and digest their food source. So both interesting approaches to uh, finding a new solution to nutrients. This one uses a tube structure and this one uses a actual mechanical mechanism, but both are augmentations of a single leaf. So now that we know a little bit more about these plants, let's add them to our setup. So I'm gonna start with the pitcher plant. Now, you can see that it's in a, a dense uh, moss structure. So this is there's almost no nutrients coming from this. It's basically just a means of holding the root system together. So I'm gonna start by putting my pitcher plant in the back of my pot. I may actually end up raising it up just a little bit so that it, it's a little bit higher in my pot. I maybe want it up here and have a, a nice slope down. So I'll put this back in the pot for just a second. And then maybe I'll add a little bit of soil on top so that everything has something to sit on. You can see how truly light this material is. Uh, it will start to compact when you add water, and I will add a little bit of water to compact it just a little bit, because um, I don't want it to be too fluffy, but I also don't want it to be too dense. Uh, the root systems don't want to have to work too hard to get through uh, our substrate. So, I'll add my pitcher plant back here. Yeah, that feels okay. And then my Venus flytraps, again, squeeze them out of the pot. So, each of these plants, they actually produce root systems that go pretty far down. Um, they may extend six to eight to 10 inches down on an adult plant. Obviously this container is not that deep. So this, these plants will need to be rehomed relatively quickly. Probably within a year, they're going to need to be rehomed, but that's fine. Um, because another feature of these plants is that they need to go into dormancy, which makes them not an ideal house plant. They're actually a great plant to have outside. Uh, they need to go into dormancy for three to four months out of the year. Uh, these plants are used to having, being exposed to a small amount of frost, um, but not severe. So you're talking if you're living in a, an environment or a part of the country where you're getting a few days where it's a little bit below freezing, they'll be fine outside. But if you live in a part of, uh, of the world where you're getting extended periods of a month long where you're 10 or 15 degrees below freezing, that's going to be a real problem. These plants won't make it. So that's a thing to consider when you're uh, getting into carnivorous plants, or these carnivorous plants at least. Uh, do you have a way to put them into their own dormancy? So what I recommend doing is either putting them outside in an environment like I live in where it doesn't get too, too cold, or if you have an area of your house that is not heated, putting them out in that area or you're in your garage for uh, the winter months. So I will continue adding my, my substrate. Oh gosh, poured that all over you, I'm sorry. Uh, I've also read that you can use um, coconut husks as a, as a stratum, as a material to support your plants. Although because coconuts are often exposed to uh, salt water, you need to very, very thoroughly wash them and make sure that you get rid of all the salt buildup in the coconut husks. So that's another uh, sustainable way of creating a, a low nutrient soil. I'm just gonna continue filling in all the corners around my, my plants. Um, all of these Venus slide traps are gonna be pretty unhappy with the amount of soil that I've gotten into their, their traps, but I will try to wash them clean before I finish this process so that they, uh, they can go back to their, their daily job of catching nutrients for the plant. Add a little bit more soil 
to below these plants. And then once I've finished laying down my, the last of my substrate, I will also uh, add a nice layer of moss around them, which I think is mainly just for me, if I'm being honest. Uh, I don't think the, the plants need or appreciate the competition, but I think it will make the whole setup look a little bit more appealing and a little bit more finished. So I think that we are done with our peat moss for now. So I'm gonna actually go fill up a water bottle with some um, distilled water, and I will spray down these plants to get all of the peat out of uh, the plants and get them looking nice and professional. All right, so now I'm gonna start laying down my moss. Uh, this was moss that was, again, collected from just outside. I live in Virginia, so I actually live in an area not that far away from where these plants are native. So that's exciting. This really does feel like a, uh, a setup that does have plants that are all, that would be native to the same environment, although perhaps they would not necessarily all grow in the same exact area. So I'll just be adding little patches of moss all around. And this moss will eventually fill and grow in all of, all of the, uh, the holes and create a beautiful, beautiful little setup. So I'm not too worried about having open areas. Um, it will eventually fill in. Now in terms of placement, a setup like this really needs direct sunlight. So if you have a strong southern facing window, this would be a great place for that. Um, alternatively, if you are in an area where you can uh, stand to have it outside, that would be a great option as well. Uh, these plants really do require more sun than you might think. So that's something to consider as well. If you put them too far away from your window, really any distance away from your window at all, they won't get the, new, or the sun that they need and they will start to get stringy. Um, the leaves will get elongated in an attempt to find a patch of sunlight. And uh, that's a great sign that you need to move your plants to a place that they would enjoy a little bit more. So I'm just gonna add a couple of rocks in the mix so that we create a nice little uh, aesthetic look here. Just something, a little point of interest so that it's not just green. There we go. Put this up here. Yeah, let me take a look at what I've what I've created. It's a little bit too even, so I'm going to move a couple of things around just a little bit. So bear with me. I will show you what I've created in just a moment. Okay, I feel okay about this. So I'm going to add a few sticks. Uh, these sticks that I'm using are sold in the aquarium hobby as spider wood. Uh, these are just a few little fragments. Uh, and I'll add them in to create a little bit of a look. Um, you know, something a little bit more whimsical. So I'm going to add these in this way so that I can actually see what's happening. So bear with me. I'm trying to create a little bit of directionality into my setup. So that the, the all the sticks look like they're kind of uh, motivated by the same same influence. Maybe it's a strong wind, maybe it's the light is going in one direction, but no matter what, I'm trying to create something that has a little bit of character, a little bit of look. I'll break this stick in two. All right, so that's my final setup. I will find a great location for this, but first I'll shoot a couple of beauty shots so you can appreciate what we've done here. As I show you those shots, let's talk through a couple of concerns that you need to keep an eye out for. 
First, you need to make sure that your substrate is low in nutrients. Peat soil is a great option for that. Second, you need to make sure that your substrate is consistently moist, um, bordering on wet. If you're keeping these plants in pots, you actually want to have about a quarter inch to a half inch of water standing in whatever canister those pots are sitting in so that the peat moss can passively absorb moisture and keep the root systems wet at all times. If you're struggling with your plants, if it feels like they are not happy in some way, uh, the general causes are threefold. One, you're using water that has too many dissolved minerals in it. You need to be using distilled water or rainwater. Second, you're not getting enough light for your plants. You need to either have them in a southern facing window or you need to find an outdoor location for these plants. And third, you want to make sure that your plants are actually getting nutrients. So if you're keeping them indoors and they don't have access to flies, you need to start feeding them insects uh, yourself. Not too much, uh, just enough to keep them going and healthy. Outside, they're natural predators, they will be able to catch everything themselves. You don't need to worry about anything. And these pitchers will actually start filling up with flies. Uh, you'll end up seeing lots of little black spots when the sun is shining through these pitchers. And you'll say, oh gosh, look at how successful these plants really are. These plants are a wonder of evolution. Carnivorous plants are incredible. They're a unique part of our ecosystems. And it's an awesome experience to get to see them and take care of them yourselves. With that, I hope you enjoyed this setup. I hope you learned something and I hope that I've earned your subscription. So if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button. Thanks so much for watching and I will see you next time.